Okay, everybody's muted now. Okay, so we will begin this, this meeting. Uh, thank you, thank you everyone for joining this meeting for the Charlevoix, Charlevoix Superfund site. Uh, we wanted to have a meeting just to update you all on the latest uh, site activity. And uh, so we'll have a couple of presenters here. It's Matt O from the US Environmental Protection Agency, Region 5. And we'll also have Jeff Hall from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, that's the engineering firm that's helping us manage this, this uh, project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, before we begin, uh, just a few notes about the meeting, how it works. Uh, usually we'd have this meeting, or ideally we'd have this meeting in person in Charlevoix. Uh, but since this is a, a virtual meeting, uh, you know, over the phone or a computer, uh, it's a little bit different on how it works. So uh, just so you know, uh, all attendees are muted, muted during the presentation. Uh, we will have a Q&A session after the presentation. Uh, we will record the presentation portion, not the Q&A. So, uh, you know, you can feel free to ask any questions uh, uh, after the presentation. And uh, this recording of the of the presentation, we will upload uh, to our website. We'll include a link there so you can uh, watch the, the meeting or uh, you know, pass along the, to the link to anyone who missed this, this meeting. Uh, we will also have the slides uploaded to the, to the EPA website. And uh, that's the address right there. Uh, we'll have the, uh, the URL for, for, this, for the website also at the end so you can uh, make a note of it. And uh, it should have been in the invitation as well that you received. Uh, next slide, please. So what we're gonna be talking about today is uh, just a quick recap of where the site is located within the city. Uh, we'll touch on the remedial investigation and uh, the feasibility study. Uh, we'll also talk about site risks and uh, We'll also talk about uh, community participation, the selected remedy. Uh, we'll move on to talk about demolition, excavation. We'll also cover the, uh, the cleanup technologies. One of them is air sparge and soil vapor extraction. Uh, we'll talk about the pilot study that we're gonna be implementing soon uh, uh, for those cleanup technologies. Uh, then the Army Corps of Engineers will also talk about the additional source soil investigation and the uh, exposure areas. After that, we will have a, a question and answer uh, session. Uh, so we will not be recording the, the question and answer uh, session because uh, you know, we want uh, folks to be comfortable you know, asking their questions, uh, uh, but we will we'll definitely include a summary of the questions asked and the answers and uh, probably add them to, to the document we add on the website. And uh, so uh, to begin the presentation, uh, we, we have Matt O. He's a remedial project manager with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Region 5. And uh, Matt, all you. Uh, Matt, you'll have to unmute yourself. Ah, thank you. Okay, um, and could you flip to the next slide? All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. So uh, this is the Charlevoix Municipal Well Superfund site. Um, it's much of the central portion of the city you see outlined in red on the the diagram on the right there. Um, it uh, is the boundaries are, are given here that Pine River Channel that uh, sheet pile uh, contained channel up at the north end of the uh, city um, uh, by Lake Michigan and then Round Lake on the northeast side, May Street to the east and Carpenter Streets to the south and Sherman and Beacon on the west. And of course, Lake Michigan uh, kind of forms the north northwest there, just beyond the channel. Okay, next slide. Uh, 
Um, so we, uh, in, in reevaluating this site, we completed the remedial investigation uh, throughout this, this outlined area. Uh, that's our study area. And we divided it up into four uh, sub areas or portions, um, A, B, C, and D. And um, you know, kind of investigated those sources and uh, the plumes extending from those source areas. Um, our main constituents of concern that we identified were tetrachloroethylene and trichloroethylene, uh, both chlorinated solvents. Uh, the tetrachloroethylene predominantly used in the dry cleaning uh, business and the trichloroethylene uh, predominantly used in uh, metal finishing uh, before applying coatings and paints and that sort of thing. Um, we found risk levels that, that didn't require us to uh, take remedial action, uh, both in soil and groundwater. Uh, and we developed a feasibility study uh, based on that investigation to uh, both develop our remedial action alternatives that would be able to clean the, clean the site up and address that contamination. Okay, next slide. Um, this is the site conceptual model. Um, it's a, a way of visually uh, seeing what the exposure paths are for uh, residents and workers with the city. Um, we understand that there were several old dry cleaning facilities and some small manufacturing facilities that contributed to this contamination over the years. Um, and this is intended to show uh, kind of what would happen if, if uh, materials were spilled or leached or passed through uh, drain lines and got into the, the subsurface, got underground. Um, they can move down and impact the groundwater. Uh, they can also um, form vapors that can move up into buildings and other occupied structures. So uh, this just gives some of the exposure pathways to help visualize how the contamination from, from obviously many years ago could still be impacting uh, people potentially today. Okay, next slide. Uh, so this is a, a kind of a timeline for the decision process, uh, developing a re remedy for the site um, in 2019. Um, we completed the uh, remedial investigation, as I said, and the focus feasibility study, and then used that information um, to put out a proposed plan for public review and comment. And then um, after we had our first meeting, um, you'll see that first comment, that comment period of November 18th to January 18th um, is, is longer than, than the usual uh, 30 days. Um, we extended the public comment period, and we uh, had a second meeting after the uh, first meeting that we, we held up in, in the uh, library. Um, we published the, uh, the basically a notice that the, rem the proposed plan is uh, ready for review by the public in late 2019, um, had our first meeting in December, and then our second meeting in January. Um, the first meeting was uh, kind of a more formal meeting, um, and we, after after that meeting, we thought we should, really should have an informal meeting as well, that more of an open house style that would allow people a better better chance to uh, discuss and and fully get their questions answered um, from the first meeting. So, um, in uh, April, then um, after reviewing public comment and. Uh, the information in the uh, in the proposed plan, we uh, developed a record of decision, which is our formal decision document, uh, and that selected alternative six um, out of the alternatives that were presented in the uh, feasibility study and the proposed plan. Um, I think that's it. Okay, next slide. Um, so that, that interim record of decision that we produced in April um, of 2020 selected uh, alternative six, as I said, which included the following um, actions or, or components. Um, institutional controls uh, to prevent receptors from unacceptable exposures. 
Um, these are uh, things like environmental covenants, ordinances um, that basically ask that people not take certain actions in certain areas um, where they might be exposed to either vapors or, or groundwater that's contaminated. Um, we have uh, demolition and soil excavation. Uh, some of the old dry cleaning buildings actually have contaminants still remaining underneath them. And in some cases, even in old pipes that were used in the dry cleaning uh, process, uh, those solvents are still in those pipes under the buildings and still acting as a source of contamination, both to groundwater and also to the vapor that I, that I mentioned earlier, that we have a concern that when those vapors get into occupied structures and can uh, cause exposures uh, for the people in those structures. Um, it, uh, the remedy also includes vapor mitigation at all the structures where we have uh, those vapors exceeding our cleanup goals, our remedial goals. And we have air sparging and soil vapor extraction uh, to treat the soils and groundwater that are, that are uh, contaminated uh, throughout that, throughout the site. And we have uh, in-situ chemical oxidation or other in-situ type treatment um, to try to break down the trichloro, or sorry, tetrachloroethylene in the groundwater where it exceeds 15 micrograms per liter, which is just a common unit of measure. Um, that concentration we found um, above that concentration uh, will will be a continuing source for for other contamination in the shallow groundwater. So, where we where we find that after taking these other steps we would uh, do some kind of in situ chemical treatment, such as chemical oxidation to break that down and try to achieve that, uh, that number, that concentration, if you will, in the, in the groundwater. Okay, next slide. Um, the next uh, section I'll, I'll, I'll turn over to Jeff, but again, this is the institution controls where we'll be working with the city to uh, likely put an um, ordinance or other measure in place uh, to uh, basically prevent exposures. Um, we have concerns with the vapors and the contaminated groundwater that uh, during excavation work that might be common, especially with utility work and um, that sort of that sort of uh, process that that people could become exposed to those. So. Uh, that is something that's that's in the works, and uh, I will turn it over to Jeff Hall then with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Jeff Hall. I'm the Chief of Environmental Engineering at uh, Buffalo District. This uh, support that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has been provided by two districts, um, uh, Detroit and uh, Buffalo District. Buffalo, um, based on our uh, our expertise, which is in hazardous, toxic, and radioactive waste, uh, are the the lead technical uh, group that's working uh, for the Corps on this project, and and typically in Detroit is uh, leads the project management, real estate components, and some contracting issue um, uh, component of the of the work. Uh, next slide, please. As Matt uh, mentioned, uh, institutional controls are something that's. Uh, ongoing discussions or, or preliminary discussions with um, the, the city. Uh, the predominant concern is uh, protection of utility and construction workers in some of the areas where we, we show unacceptable risk for vapor. Um, and um, I don't know, so uh, one of the key aspects too, as far as, as groundwater, everybody in the city is required to use the city water and not uh, use private private wells. So that kind of takes that one pathway away. And like I said, the major pathway is the the, the mitigation of vapor uh, intrusion or vapor risk that uh, that uh, predominantly construction workers may, may encounter. Um, you know, so typically would be, you know, require protective equipment monitoring when that works ongoing, um, which is fairly typical for most utility workers. They're usually uh, um, monitoring atmospheric air uh, when they're doing that type of work and making sure that they're, they're getting fresh air while they're doing that. So it shouldn't it shouldn't be anything necessary out of the ordinary. It's just more of a notification for for those folks uh, prior to doing any work to, to be prepared before they start doing it. Um, next slide, please. 
And so it, uh, this is going to this section is going to kind of focus on some of the exposure areas where we see an un unacceptable risk currently before the remedy is uh, is completed. Next slide, please. So here's the this one structure here, STU001. It's at uh, Garfield Avenue in Area A. Um, concern is uh, PC for resident and construction worker and TC for resident to small extent. Um, should be this near this structure here, but it should be noted that, that structure is not um, known to be used uh, a residential use structure. So um, you know, the concern again is more uh, construction worker doing some some work in and around that area where the the contamination is noted. Um, as I mentioned previously, uh, we're recommending uh, protection of utility and construction workers for work when they work in shallow so uh, shallow soil, and then uh, you know protect uh, residents from direct contact. Which, like I said, that that property, as far as we're aware, is not used for residential purposes. Um, and as I noted, this is all these these uh, controls are really in place uh, up up until the uh, the remedy is complete or then it, it's significantly complete construction complete. Uh, next slide, please. So soil gas, um, the uh, the orange line or the orange hashed areas is, uh, represents uh, unacceptable exposure for or, uh, potential exposure for TCE, and then blue is PCE. Um, it's also noting the potential source areas in the various uh, areas A, B, and C. Um, again, uh, this is uh, we're recommending that there's some institutional controls to protect utility and construction workers when they're planning to, you know, prior to, so they're notified prior to doing work in these areas and they have the uh, procedures and, and uh, they're aware of what, what's going to make sure their workers are safe while they're working in these areas. Next slide, please. So now we're going to talk about, uh, you know, like, like Matt had said, uh, the demolition and, and, and soil excavation in these areas of these former uh, facilities is really key to, to cleaning up the, uh, the site. And without removal of this, this source area, this, uh, the, we've shown through our modeling and our investigation and, and the, feas in the feasibility study that if these areas aren't addressed. Um, it's going to be very difficult to clean up groundwater and then uh, um, clean up the soil vapor. Um, next slide, please. So these next few slides focus on the different source, um, ex, you know, excavation and demolition work that's going to happen in the three primary areas. This is area A. Just like point out, um, as shown, this is this is the extent of uh, of soil contamination, and it's giving a couple different modeled extents. And so this is based on a model that. Uh, we prepared here at the Corps of Engineers. And then you'll see uh, the blue area, it says uh, modeled extent of contamination, 50% probability and modeled extent of contamination, 80% probability. And what that probability is saying is um, the, it's, it's the, the likelihood that you've removed all the contamination um, above cleanup levels. The, the, the greater confidence means that you're more likely if you dig that up you're more likely to get everything um that you need to that you need to get so the reason we're showing the 250 and the the 50 percent and the 80 percent is the 50 percent is a good starting point for our contractors just to go ahead and 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 based on the data and the modeling we're pretty confident that that area is going to have to be excavated so the contractors are going to target those areas initially and then through a process of screening um in the field and some analytical, they'll keep chasing the contamination until it's all uh, all removed and disposed of properly in a in a, um, a proper disposal facility like a landfill. Um, so we're designing uh, the remediation and the source removal to that eighty percent, and uh, you know, so it's you, you might think to yourself, well, why don't you want to go one hundred percent? Well, the one hundred percent line is to the points we know are clean. And so we don't. We know we don't. We're probably not going to have to dig that far. And based on our past experience on similar remediations, we typically get to the 80 percent, and we, we we achieve remedi remediation. So that's why we're showing these two extents. And and so this figure, you see, some of those some of those boundaries extend under um, under existing structures, and that's where uh, the demolition activity would occur prior to um, prior to excavation. Um, 
some key things to point out, you know, the structures that are not going to be demolished or impacted, we will protect those with geotechnical and structural measures um, to ensure that uh, those those properties and, and structures aren't aren't affected by the remediation. Um, let's cycle to the next slide, please, because these are all pretty they're pretty repetitive, but it give you a good flavor. Maybe I'll think of other things. Um, area B, this is relatively shallow um, and should be uh, a relatively quick. Uh, remediation, but again, you're seeing that model of extent where we'll be targeting that 50% with the contract, and then have the, the the contractor will will plan all structural measures um, and protection measures to be able to excavate the 80%, which is the likely uh, the likely footprint. Um, next slide, please. Again, area C, you can see this this same thing. You're, we're showing the model of extent of contaminated soil. Um, you know, and I, I, I neglected to highlight that those orange dots are, are so so of orange where we exceeded criteria. Um, and the other the, the, the white dots are where we took we took samples and it did not exceed criteria. And I said all that all that information in addition to some field screening gets put into a model. It's a probability model. It, it's like I said, it's, it's kind of a simple way to describe it is you got 0% confidence is a dirty point. 100% confidence all the way to a clean point, but based on the nature of the contamination, you typically never get to that that close to those clean points, and that's where that probability model comes in. Um, next slide, please. So this is a current schedule of the demolition and excavation. Uh, we're currently in the, the design phase. Um, we've completed the 30% design and presented that to the UCPA. A remedial action board which approves implementation that occurred that meeting occurred i think we're still waiting for um, uh, funding approval for that uh, there's a lot of activities that are going to take place um, uh, subsequently and some of these things have already started but since there's some properties that need to be acquired and demolished there's a there's a, a, a significant, significant amount of work to make that happen where we've got appraisals and titles and surveys, acquisitions, negotiations, relocation. And then we can actually advertise that construction contract. And by the point we get to get to that point, the design will be fully fleshed out. Um, I'm going to talk about some of those some of those design activities, which are include some additional investigation activities that um, are actually ongoing now. Some of you may have seen drill rigs and, and folks from the Army Corps uh, in your neighborhoods doing some of this work. Um, I'll save my discussion on that till we get to those, that point of the slide. But like I said, um, we're target, you know, like I said, this is based on the current schedule. It's all pending funding and a lot of these activities um, to be completed. But right now, um, looking like 2023 is when uh, we are hoping to award that contract and, and do the, do the, um, the construction work or remediation work. Next slide, please. So like I said, um, you know, we have a model based on the data that we collected during the I, RI, the remedial investigation. And um, we realized that, you know, at some point in the remedial investigation, you got to kind of move on to the feasibility study, but there were some data gaps, you know, and some of the areas on the edges of these plumes, there were some uncertainty and we wanted to really get a tighter, um, I guess a better handle on the extents before we put this up um, uh, put out the, co the, the contract, do the remediation. So we're doing some additional borings um, within and on the edge of those, those modeled extents uh, or those plumes based on how, what we, what we know now. And the idea is to hopefully get a, to get a better, better confidence and um, a better contract uh, plan for doing that remediation. So um, next slide, please. Uh, Sorry, probably talking over some of the stuff that I could be showing. So they said, yeah, so additional source area soil sampling is necessary to um, accurately characterize the extents. Um, so we, we picked those locations based on uh, gaps in the current modeling. Um, some of that was done with the uh, geospatial software that was used to, to develop the uh, model. Um, it it, it, it kind of helps us guide us where those locations are, but some of that's based on um, some of those samples are based on knowledge of the field personnel that have been out there doing some of the work. And then some of the key aspects of the design also 
um, are playing a part in where we're doing some locations. And that maybe with respect to like some of those structural measures that we're going to do to protect those adjacent properties and structures, uh, we want to make sure that we know that we won't be leaving anything behind so that we so we want to know where that contamination extends uh, potentially to those other structures. So that's that's some of the, the, the goals of this of this uh, this current event. Um, we're doing field screening with uh, handheld meters, basically organic vapor monitors. So we're taking soil samples as uh, as they're doing these uh, these deep borings um, and uh, screening the samples for just in general what kind of volatile organic compounds may be present in the in the soil sample. We're also doing field um, kit sampling to give us a um, a pretty accurate. Uh, Measurement of some of those of those chlorinated solvents, and we're also sending a subset of those samples into for into analytical laboratories um, to get actual data uh, and determine if if we are above or below the cleanup levels. Um, we also hope in that you know one of the side benefits of doing this additional investigation, we're testing out a technology that we haven't we haven't used here at the district, but like I said, those field those field kits, and we're hoping that that will be um, uh, incorporated into the final design. And the benefit of using those field kits is we can get answers quickly, um, complete the remediation quicker, and not rely on analytical data, which sometimes can be held up as you're waiting for samples to get like shipped to a lab, and then the they get, it gets in their queue in the lab's queue for running the analysis, and then they do their QAQC. And by the time we get the data back, it can be sometimes a longer process. And, and the goal of this design is to get in there, do this work safely, and do it as quick as possible. So there's, there's to minimize the impacts to residents and and the neighborhood, and not have open excavations long or excavations open longer than necessary. Um, so we're like I said, so part of this. Uh, in addition to taking that data and using it to update our model, we're also trying to improve. You know, so trying to improve the design, um, tighten it up a little bit, and make sure that when we go out there um, in a, in a, in a couple years, um, once the design's finished and everything else, all the other uh, preceding activities have been completed, that we complete this quick, you know, safely and as and as quick as possible to minimize any uh, impacts. Uh, next slide, please. So, like I said, this work's been ongoing. Um, they've they started in November. They've been working ten day shifts. Um, they are have pretty much completed almost all the the the, the initial borings that we had planned. They're going to be coming back next week to finish up those original planned borings. Then we've got some optional borings that we're going to. Um, Look at the initial data that we received from the laboratory, some of that field screen data, and make sure that we get all the data we need at this for, during this event so we can take it back and, and do our modeling and, and then um, update and finalize that design. Um, you, yeah, so the drill rig's probably uh, the size of a, uh, the footprint of a normal, maybe a large truck. Um, it's uh, moving around, it's got a mast, uh, pretty high mast. Like I said, it's, it's uh, pretty standard drilling equipment. Um, there's there's probably a folks some folks out with a tent doing some you know processing soil cores and screening samples and running field tests. Um, like I said, there's probably another about another 10 days of that work and that's going to resume on Monday. Um, you know they're making every effort they can not to block sidewalks or crosswalks, um, and they're they're using the the Charlevoix. Um, um, DPW lot, I believe, to uh, store their equipment. So there's, there shouldn't be too much uh, out on the street. But like I said, that that works ongoing. It should be wrapped up pretty soon. Um, anything that gets disturbed or, um, you know, as, they, as they're doing these soil borings with this drill rig, it's getting repaired after uh, after they're done. So the idea is to leave it leave it as good or better than we we found it. Next slide, please. So I already kind of talked about schedule that the work's ongoing. Um, we've been, the data's been trickling in, but there's a validation process and um, all that data needs to be uploaded into our database and our GIS system. And then the model gets run and then that data is going to go back to the designers to to um, to complete the, uh, the source removal demolition design work. Next slide, please. All right, so we mentioned the air spired and soil vapor. 
So there's a, I'm sorry, next slide, please. So I'll talk about what, you know, the, the Airspire Jess V is a, a, a component of the remedy. The first, the first component, like I said, was the soil, the, the, the demolition and source removal, which is the probably one of the most important steps because that's where it's going to remove the majority of the mass of the contamination. And then we're going to do the in, the in situ chemical exudation to treat those areas where the groundwater contamination is above that part uh, 15 parts per parts per billion. That you know that's basically injecting um, chemical oxidants into the subsurface to destroy those chemicals. But there's going to be some residual contamination in the groundwater at relatively low levels. That's going to continue to progress as groundwater moves north um, under the the city towards the towards the lakes. Um, so as a final polishing step, the remedy includes uh, three air sparge SV uh, curtains, and um, basically, as shown on this figure here, air sparging is uh, injecting air into the subsurface via. Um, Essentially, they're monitoring wells, but they're specially designed uh, with a smaller screen to inject air into the subsurface below the contamination, um, below the groundwater level. And, you, and that figure, you see that yellow or that yellow triangle. That's that's depicting the the groundwater elevation or the groundwater surface. So that that injection well, air injection well, gets installed below the contamination, or just below the contamination, and um, a fairly large compressor is used to to push air to overcome the the hydraulic head of that of that water that's uh, that groundwater, and it pushes air up through the contaminated zone. And while it's doing that, it it vaporizes um, uh, the chemicals. They volatilize, and so it's basically it, it's it, it's uh, speeding up the volatilization pr uh, process. So it's that, that air um, plus the contaminants is moving up through the surface. So we don't want that contaminated air um, uh, exiting up to the surface or into, into neighboring structures or utilities. So the other component is the soil vapor extraction. So basically the idea of the soil vapor extraction is to um, capture those, that air, uh, that air sparge effluent and containerize, you know, um, you know, bring that to the soil vapor extraction blower. So it's another type of blower that's actually pulling a vacuum and it's pulling that air. It's likely going to run it, they run it through some treatment, which is typically granulated activated carbonate carbon. So that'll scrub all those contaminates out and then discharge um, uh, relatively clean air up into the, up into the atmosphere. So that's the, 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 the general um, simple, uh, idea of like what how this how this technology works so if you can there's going to be a later maybe i'll save this for later but we're going to have to do pilot studies to help inform the design some of the design components are making sure you know how many air sparge wells do we need in a curtain to effectively treat the 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 plume as it's passing passing by these curtains so we're going to see what kind of radius of influence those air sparging wells could have uh, for the full scale design. And also we want to make sure that we, we can capture, um, uh, those vapors. So we're doing it where we run a series of pilot studies in three different areas. Uh, next slide, please. So here's an example of the equipment that, um, will be utilized during those pilot studies. And the pilot studies are really going to run for about, um, work, work in each of these areas is about a, is about a week and, um, week long. The actual tests are probably going to be about one day. They're going to be they're going to be um, occurring during normal business hours, you know, like eight to eight a.m. to five p.m. Um, there will be a that soil vap vapor extraction trailer on the right hand side of the screen. That's a typical portable treatment unit. So like that trailer will be mobilized to each of these locations. And so each you know for each of these studies, that trailer is going to move to the you know first study area. Um, along with that generator, because we need to have power to power those blowers. So there'll be a, there'll be a generator and you've probably seen those, uh, you know, utility companies and construction companies ut utilize those generators quite a bit. So you, 
a lot of people are probably familiar with those. Um, and that trailer, so all those, all that equipment that was depicted in that cartoon is inside inside that trailer. There'll be an air sparge blower, a soil vapor extraction blower, and then granulated activated carbon and some associated telemetry and, and other uh, control panels and pumps and whatnot. Um, and so that, that unit, everything's self-contained. It can be mobilized, set up temporarily, run the pilot study for, like I said, a day. Um, prior to the actual pilot study, we're going to have to install uh, a network of wells. Next slide, please. So I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm talking before the slides, and I apologize for that. Um, so this slide shows the, the conceptual design for the actual sparge curtains. And you can see this is the, the modeled residual plume as it's heading through uh, Charlevoix over time. Um, so you can see the three cart, the three sparge curtains kind of intersect that plume. And like I said, these, this is the conceptual layout. The actual layout is going to change after, as we progress through the design phase and you know, after we've completed these pilot studies. Um, uh, next slide. Okay, so again, the, the the orange lines on the map are the the, the conceptual uh, location for the the sparge SV uh, curtains, and then the blue hashed areas where we're proposing to do the pilot the pilot studies. So we did a, we're doing a pilot study in each of these you know along the each of these proposed um, uh, air sparge SV curtains to kind of get site you know specific data. Uh, related to the subsurface and how like these you know these pilot study systems react, so we can we can do the full scale design for each of these curtains. Um, so I think I've kind of talked through. Like you said we want to maximize the vapor extraction point flow rate and the radius of influence. We want to optimize the air sparge radius of influence and match the extraction. So like I said, we want to make sure that anything any area we're injecting any any air effluent, we want to make sure that that gets that gets pulled into the extraction system. It doesn't like start short circuiting like to utilities or to um, up to the ground or or even worse uh, into 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 a structure. So that's the idea of this pilot study is to make sure that we design a full scale system that's going to a if you know effectively treat the groundwater as planned and also make sure that there's no impacts to to residents, business or the business uh, owners or um, or just neighbors. Um, we're also going to monitor groundwater, uh, soil vapors, uh, upgrading, upgrading and downgrading the sparge uh, tests to assess the performance. And uh, let's see what else. I think that's good for this slide. Next slide, please. So this is the next three slides are kind of a uh, more detailed view of the proposed uh, pilot study locations. So this is at the intersection of West Upright Street and State Street. So each of these pilot studies are going to have one air sparge point, one soil vapor extraction point, and five monitoring wells. Um, so on this figure, we've, we've already uh, made an initial attempt to lay out where these where these uh, air sparge SV and and monitoring wells are going to be located, they're subject to change based on actual field conditions, you know, including like where the utilities are, or any other restrictions. You know, we're we're going to we're going to be putting these in the in the right of way, um, uh, the city right of way, and we'll also be con conscious of like paved areas and things like that. So we'll we'll avoid. Uh, drilling through uh, paved areas when we can only do it when absolutely necessary and necessary to you know reduce any kind of impacts and also reduce the amount that has to be uh, restored um, like I said before we're going to um, have that uh, like a temporary trailer that has the compressors and air uh, and the SV blower and the treatment system for each study hall or study area that trailer is going to get moved around for each of these tests so it'll only be um, at each of these each of these three locations for no more than a week, and I said it's only gonna it's only gonna operate for about a day. So um, I think I it was on the slide, but I neglected to say it. You know, every effort's gonna be made to keep the uh, the noise level below 85 decibels, and that 85 decibels is like is an OSHA limit based on how much you, um, how much uh, someone can 
can be exposed to over an eight hour period without any any negative effects to um, to hearing. And like I said, that 85 decibels is going to be just outside, you know, outside. Actually, we're going to keep that 85 within the trailer. So as you move further away from those trailers and generators, the noise level is going to be a lot lower. So, um, you know, if you're standing inside one of those trailers, you'd probably want to have ear protection. But when you're outside, it's going to be, you know, noisy, but not to the point where it's going to be uh, uh, an impact. And like I said, we're going to do that during during um, during business hours to minimize any. So we won't be running these things at night. Um, the full, just a real quickly, the full scale system, the low, there's going to be, you know, one in each of these curtains that could be a temporary trailer, but we definitely won't need a generator for those. Those will have connect, you know, permanent power connections for the full scale system. So the noise levels for the, the full scale system should be a lot lower than these temporary systems. Um, one component of the tests while we're you know while we're doing these injections and extractions they said we're, we're we'll be we'll be closely monitoring the injections and monitoring you know monitoring vapor pressures and vacuums and in these monitoring wells to see what our, our radius of influence is we're also proposing to do vapor monitoring within those structures that are nearby um, the idea is just as a, a although we've modeled that there would not be an unacceptable exposure in those in those structures, if um, vapors were to somehow get in there during this test, we still want to do that monitoring to help inform the design just as an extra level of precaution. So, um, so we're planning on doing some vapor monitoring in, the, in those structures during the day that before and, and during that test. Um, next slide. So these are all going to be pretty. These are all going to be pretty uh, similar, just different locations. So this is the the central um, pilot study location for the central um, air spired SV curtain. Um, this is at the intersection of Antr Antrim Street and State Street. Again, um, one air sparge point will be installed, one soil vapor extraction point, and five monitor wells. Those are installed like uh, with a drill rig. Um, they'll be they'll be permanent structures with uh, flush mount, um, flush uh, uh, protective covers. So, um, you know, they, they wouldn't be noticeable as you're driving by, but if you're walking in the grass, you'll see like a metal, a uh, round metal um, manhole uh, that'll be locked. Um, again, the same thing, these locations are, are preliminary. Um, when we actually go to install these wells, they'll probably be modified based on utilities or, or, or field conditions. Um, same thing, we plan on monitoring doing vapor monitoring these structures uh, that are near the near this, this test while we're doing that. I neglected to say the first time that, you know, we, we, we kind of put a, a location where we think the trailer is going to go. Again, we're going to try to avoid blocking traffic. We're going to try to avoid blocking the sidewalks. That trailer may be moved somewhere else if there's a better location that the that the prop, you know, that uh, that when they're going to when they're setting up, if it looks like it's going to be a problem putting it there, we'll move it somewhere else. Um, as far as how we're going to do the, the, you know, connect to these wells, like I said, there's going to, these wells for the most part, if someone were walking by when we're not doing the test after these wells have been installed, this is going to be like, like, uh, some, some manhole covers or man, small manholes that are, that are locked. But when we're actually doing the test, we'll open that up and connect uh, temporary hosing hose, hose, sorry, hoses and pipes, um, from the, uh, from the, the air sparge compressor, to the air sparge well so there'll be one pipe that'll be you know on laying on the ground just for that that day or so when they're doing the test there'll be a there'll be some hoses and piping from the air, sve system back to the treatment system to, for, to the sve blower um and so that's how it, so it'll we'll, we'll have cones up and make sure folks aren't walking through the pilot study area again we're trying to do this with minimal disturbance to the properties um and so once the test is done all that piping will be removed well well, uh, uh, the the vaults will be be covered back up again and locked. So, he like said, just that day or two when those tests are, are being done, this you'll see stuff above ground. But otherwise, not much other not much activity is going to be happening other than when, than when they're installing those wells. Next slide, please. So this is the northern. So this is at uh, intersection of Clinton Street and State Street. Again, one air sparge point, 
one cell vapor extraction point and five monitor wells. Um, other than different locations, it's, 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 it's basically the same. It's going to be the same thing at this area. So next slide, please. So I probably said all this already, but uh, you know, I said one week of drilling at each location, but with drilling and well installation at each location. Um, currently, we've got that. We I think when we were putting this presentation together, we were hoping it was going to be December, January. Um, schedules changed a little bit. It's more likely going to happen uh, sometime early between January and March, some point. Um, and then after those wells are installed, we'll come back with um, with the testing equipment, and they'll be set up at each location. April May is 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 is, uh, is a good time frame still, so we're hoping to get the the pilot studies done uh, this this spring. Um, I, I noted the the wells are going to have flush mount covers installed in the right of way off the pavement without disruption to concrete or sidewalk. Um, I apologize for getting ahead of myself. I tend to do that. Uh, I tend to start talking about something before the slide comes up, so I apologize that. Um, um, we talked about the, yeah, the compressor, the blower, the treatment system we mounted in an enclosed trailer, limit noise, and we're not going to operate that outside of daylight hours. Um, he said we're going to offer nearby businesses and residents uh, monitoring during testing. As I noted, we don't expect there to be any acute or chronic risk if if and when vapors were to escape our system and get into those structures. But still, we want to monitor just for extra precaution. Um, I said any, anything that's disturbed will be repaired and, and restored to its original condition upon the test completion. Next slide, please. Here's the current schedule. Um, well installation's probably going to slip to the second quarter, and then uh, then we're going to do the the air sparge pilot study subsequently. Um, work on the full scale design. Like that, this this is all pending funding availability. So this is our current schedule. Assuming we get all the money. Um, uh, as soon as possible. Like I said, that's 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 dependent. And then we're hoping to, uh, yeah, construct this during during this next next year. I'm sorry, full scale design. I'm sorry, I got ahead of my side. This is the pilot study schedule. Um, we are going to contract some of this work, so I'm sorry about this. This is just for the pilot study itself. The actual full scale design is going to occur in 2023, and then the actual remediation is pending funding, and that'll be scheduled after that. So I apologize for the screw up on my part. Next slide, please. So this is the in situ chemical oxidation. The there's going to be some uh, pilot study and design activities that are going to are slated to occur after the air spire SV pilot studies and design. So there's, they're going to some of the activities are going to kind of over are going to overlap. Um, uh, next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, chemical oxidation. Like I mentioned previously, it's uh, injection of chemicals that uh, that degrade or destroy the, the the target constituents so for this technology the plan is is, is not to install a, necessarily a full-scale system that's going to operate continuously but it's more of a a series of events to inject these these chemicals into the subsurface specifically targeting the groundwater contamination and this cartoon shows you a general idea of how we're conceptually proposing to do this work um, the accident will be mixed at a central location, put into tanker trucks, brought to wells that have been previously in, previously installed, and injected either by gravity or by pump into the subsurface. Next slide, please. Like we noted previously, this this uh, is tended to address shallow groundwater cont contamination with PC concentrations greater than f uh, 15 parts per billion. So this is, you know, like I said this is the first step. You know, so we did this, yeah, you know, back to the the overarching goal or the sequence. You know, the source removal and the the building demolition is key to get the the majority of the mass out. The in situ chemical oxidation takes the the the, the contaminant mass down even further, and then the air spire just V is the is kind of looking at it as like a final polishing step to get us down to our target cleanup levels. Um, 
so the treatment zone is shown on this area. Uh, it's pointed out. Um, it's like a magenta line. So it's kind of targeting that specific area where the concentrations are above 15 parts per billion. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, the current schedule. As I noted, it kind of follows the, as far as the design and implementation, it, it, uh, at least the design, it, it follows the, the AirSpar SVE. So um, we have to do some aquifer profiling, invest, uh, an aquifer profiling investigation, which essentially kind of, kind of delineates where the contamination is, or I guess refines our knowledge of where the contamination is as you work through the, the, the groundwater zone. Uh, the saturated zone and so we're trying to really nail down exactly where those those higher concentrations are so we can target where our injection wells where the injections need to occur so we're going to just like the air sparge sv we're not going to go right to the full scale implementation we want to do a smaller scale pilot pilot study so the next step would design that pilot study implement that pilot study look at those results and then just design the full scale um in situ chemical oxidation. I hesitate to call it a system because it, it, it's going to be uh, the full scale system. We'll put some, we'll have a series of injection wells. We'll have a, you know, a series of injections that'll occur over, um, you know, it could be every every quarter, every couple months, we'll come around and, and, and do these injections. And the idea is once you've done, the, you've done a, a series of injections, you've destroyed all those chemicals in that area, you pull you pull all those wells out and then you're just relying on the air sparge SVE. So um, this isn't something that's gonna have infrastructure in place for a long time like the air sparge SVE system would. So then we kind of have some details about when we're, we're hoping to do the, the full scale design construction contract solicitation and the actual the, the contract award. So um, again, all this is pending funding, availability of funds. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Matt, for all this, uh, all this presentation, all this good information. And uh, so you might be wondering where can I get uh, information, access documents? Uh, so by far the best way to you know get up-to-date documents would be to visit our epa website for this project and i'm going to read it off for uh for folks that uh join us via audio only uh the web address is www.epa.gov forward slash superfund forward slash charlevoix dash M-U-N-I dash W-E-L-L-S. So again, www.epa.gov forward slash superfund forward slash Charlevoix Muni Wales with uh, dashes in between the words. Uh, you know, we also maintain the uh, administrative record, which is a collection of, of uh, documents generated for this project. We maintain them at two places mainly, uh, the EPA office or at the, uh, the Region 5 uh, office in Chicago, and also uh, at the Charlevoix Public Library. That one probably needs a little bit of an update. Uh, but by far the most up-to-date uh, information is at the uh, at our website. And uh, I posted that address on the, on the chat box. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so contact information, if you have any questions after this meeting is over, uh, you know, uh, and uh, if any question comes comes to mind, uh, you know, after this meeting is over, uh, you can always contact Matthew Ohl, he's the uh, project manager for the site, and uh, his phone number, I'm going to read it out for uh, the people on the phone, it's 312-886-4442. Uh, Again, it's 312-886-4442. 4442. This email is ohl.matthew at epa.gov. Again, ohl.matthew at epa.gov. And you can also contact me. My name is Charles Rodriguez. I'm a community involvement coordinator. And uh, my phone number is 312 886 7472 again is 312-886-7472 and my email address 
is Rodriguez with a Z dot Charles at epa.gov. Again, that's Rodriguez dot Charles at epa.gov. And uh, there's our uh, website address again. So I just want to thank everyone for your time. Thank you so much. And uh, and I think uh, this, this will end the meeting. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you all very much. Thank you.